Hasidism started as a spiritual revival movement, which emphasized prayer, joy, and charity. The founder of Hasidism, the Baal Shem Tov, lived from 1700 to 1760. He was a man of the people who made spirituality accessible to everyone. Scholarship was always considered as the avenue and the road to God. And in a way, it excluded many people who lived in the countryside, who did not have an education. And here comes a man who changed, not that he changed the values, but sort of the scale. He changed the scale of the values. Instead, scholarship being number one, it was based more on a relationship between men and men, between men and God. The Baal Shem Tov also rejected asceticism. He said everyday life could be sanctified, that God could be served through everything one did, eating, working, raising children. Even sex could become a spiritual act. Baal Shem Tov taught that sadness creates a barrier between man and God, while gladness and joy open the gates of heaven. Before the Hasidic movement came, Jewish religion was taught like a stick. You must do this. If not, God is going to punish you. The holy Baal Shem saw that a lot of Jews are leaving the religion because of this type of strictness. He taught us that you could do it with a galette, with a pat. Just the opposite. After the Baal Shem Tov's death, his disciples dispersed throughout Eastern Europe to spread their master's wisdom, stories, and parables. The emerging Hasidic movement was accused of heresy and was excommunicated by the recognized leader of Rabbinic Judaism, the Gaon of Vilna. The ban read, in part, Everywhere they should be torn up by the roots. They should be scattered and driven far apart, so that not two of them should remain together. Despite the ban, Hasidism became the dominant form of Judaism in much of Eastern Europe. The movement was led by charismatic teachers known as Rebbe's. When a Chassid looks at his Rebbe, he sees the embodiment of the community. The Rebbe is the king, the collective representation, the flag. He's everything rolled up in one. Every Chassid looks upon him as his own father, uh, as his grandparents. You see a lot of times pushing and shoving it. We want to listen to him. We're, we're like one. And he teaches us the past and the Torah. And, and, and most often the songs he makes and he teaches us the songs and we sing. It's, it's like uh, everything that he does, we're crazy of it. After its first century of growth, Hasidism began to lose its hold, especially on the young. The lessons taught in Hasidic schools were seen as increasingly irrelevant to the poverty and anti-Semitism faced by Jews in Eastern Europe. Many young people transferred the spiritual zeal and idealism once invested in religion to their newfound worldviews, Zionism, Socialism, and Communism. In the 1920s, the Soviet Union forced nearly all religious life underground. Synagogues were closed, 
and the parchment of the sacred scrolls was cut up and given to shoemakers to use as leather. In spite of escalating persecution, the Lubavitch Rebbe directed his emissaries, his shlichim, to organize an underground network of religious schools. There were Hasidim who pleaded with him, let's leave, let's go to Poland, let's go to Palestine. And he said, no, our mission is to be here. God put us here for some reason. And that reason is to perpetuate Judaism in this place. From the 1920s until today, the emissaries of the Rebbe's of Lubavitch have struggled to preserve Jewish religion and identity in the former Soviet Union. Today, Beryl Lazar and his wife Hani have come to Russia to train a new generation of shlichim. In 1929, the Lubavitch Rebbe traveled to the United States to raise funds for his underground schools. His American followers begged him to settle here. The Rebbe said, America is not yet ready for Hasidism. Here, he said, even rabbis have compromised and shaved their beards. The Rebbe returned to Eastern Europe, where he remained until the beginning of World War II.